Hello, my name is Fred Sutherland. This presentation is from a series of monthly lectures at Central Lakes College in Brainerd, Minnesota, called Cultural Thursdays. I was invited to speak there in March 2015 about a recent trip I had taken to Cambodia and Vietnam. The highlights of that adventure that I touch upon in this talk are the architecture, religions, industries, history, and the amazing food. My wife and I left Chicago on a direct flight to Hong Kong in the middle of January 2015. I thought it was interesting that our plane flew close to the North Pole and came down through Russia and Mongolia, rather than going directly west. From Hong Kong, we took a short connecting flight to our first destination, Siem Reap, Cambodia. The area in red right down here is the area I traveled in. That's a very small area when you think about all of Cambodia and all of Vietnam here. I only really got to spend a couple days, well, four days down in what's called now Ho Chi Minh City. But honestly, if you talk to most of the locals, they call it Saigon, and I'm going to be referring to it as Saigon for the rest of my talk, just for familiarity with us Americans, as well as well, what most of the locals still call it. This part of the world, as you can see here, centered around Cambodia, has a lot of different major cultural influences. You have India close by to the north. You also have China up to the north. So for a couple thousand years now, people from these regions have been traveling to this part of Southeast Asia and influencing the culture. One of the highways, the conduits that brings all those different cultures into contact with Southeast Asia is the Mekong River. You can sort of follow it right along here with my pointer. So it starts up in China, goes down through Burma, Laos, Thailand, and Cambodia, and eventually down into Vietnam. So I sort of liken it to like the Mississippi River of this region. And if I tried to say that I understood the Midwest by only traveling to Vicksburg, Mississippi, and New Orleans, of course, us Midwesterners here in Minnesota would be like, hey, that's not the full picture. So that's sort of what I'm saying here. I'm just traveling in this part of Cambodia and Vietnam. These are my experiences and, and views that I came across but there's certainly a lot more influence that's going on here. What's also worth noting is that there is a little bit of a struggle for power and interest that has gone on here for not just the last 40 years, but for thousands of years, probably at least 2,000 years. India and China have always weighed influence on the area. Thailand, Cambodia, and Vietnam have also competed against each other for territory. Cambodia, about 1,000 years ago, was a much larger kingdom across this entire area. And their old capital, where we're going to be starting our exploration today, was right here in a place called Siem Reap, which if you uh, translate that actually means victory over Thailand. So sort of think about if we had Washington DC changed to, we beat you England. It's sort of like that attitude that the Cambodians had over defeating a, a an army from Thailand around that time and making that their capital city, their stamp on the culture right there. So we're going to start in Siem Reap, travel down to Phnom Penh. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. And then lastly, I'll talk about Saigon. So here we're looking at a map, which if I was teaching a course on maps, this would be an example of how not to draw a map. This is, this is a tough map, but for copyright reasons, I also know that nobody's ever going to come after me for this map either. So this is a map. We're focusing on Siem Reap, that town that I talked about. They're calling it a town. There's 200,000 people living in this town, so that's another one of these critiques I have with this map. 200,000 people living currently in Siem Reap, but surrounding Siem Reap is a whole collection of temples and religious sites. That population of 200,000 is being fed by this very large hand-dug retaining pond or lake. This is about four miles long by about a mile deep that way. It is an absolutely massive water feature. And next to it, another reservoir. Now this one isn't currently full, but when this area was the capital at the height of the Khmer civilization that lived here, this was also full of water and supported probably more than the current population of 200,000 that were here. So the next couple of slides, I'm gonna focus on a few important areas around this temple complex, dozens of temples. I only got to visit a handful of them, but some of the highlights, including the famous Angkor Wat, which you see right here. I'm gonna start by showing some slides of this site called Ta Prom, and then we're going to go visit 
some of the complexes here in Angkor Thom, which means great city. And lastly, I'll show a couple slides of Angkor Wat, which means temple city. So here is that Ta Prom temple that I talked about. It is about 700 years old, and what's great about this site is that it is almost completely unmodified. This is the state that this temple was in probably a few hundred years ago, and it hasn't been modified. A lot of other sites have been restored, tried to make it a little bit easier for tourists to come through. But this one, they've allowed the jungle to just grow into the site, into the, the collapsed structures like this. You get to see these wonderful strangler fig roots and branches kind of growing intertwined with the ancient architecture here. And that's part of what made this an interesting backdrop for Hollywood movies. In particular, this site gained some fame from the movie Tomb Raider. Some scenes were actually shot there at Top Prom. Another important series of temples from about 800 to 1,000 years ago are the Bafuan. Now this one has a very large ceremonial causeway. Most of these temples, as you saw on the map, are rectangular. There are usually four entrances, and they're on the cardinal directions, north, south, east, and west. Now not every entrance is functional. Sometimes they're just ceremonial, but at least one is meant for long processions of priests and royalty and important dignitaries to come through. And this is one of those raised causeways. Now in the rainy season, these may fill up with water in the past. So this would be a raised, elevated causeway to keep you above the water. And these pedestals you see over here, these would have supported a wooden causeway, again, to put the walkway above any sort of water that was in this area here. So it would have been a very grand ceremonial entrance right here to the temple. An older temple, this older one here, Femayanakas, thousand years old, started out as a Hindu temple. Now, some of the more recent ones, like the one you just saw previously, was a Buddhist temple. Many of these Hindu temples later on had a life as a Buddhist temple or shrine. And of course, seeing an ancient temple like this, and the guide said it was okay, I decided to go climb to the top of Fimianakas right here. So here I am actually climbing that very steep climb up to the top. And when I reached the top, even though this seemed like it had been abandoned for hundreds of years, there is an active, in this case, I believe it's a Buddhist shrine that's going on right here, some incense burning, some offerings. And it's an important thing to remember as a traveler to this part of Southeast Asia. Just because a site looks like it's ancient and abandoned, it may actually still be active. And the culture is very socially conservative. They expect visitors to sacred places like this to be properly clothed. That means clothes that cover the knee and cover the shoulder in particular. Short shorts or muscle t-shirt, mm -mm, not a good idea. That would be very disrespectful to any of the priests and locals there. They, they wouldn't really shine to that. And a couple extreme cases of Westerners misbehaving on these sites have actually caused people to be kicked out of the country or fined or even jailed. So they do take your appearance at these sacred sites very importantly. Now I actually have a few short clips from the top of these temples, the Bafuan and the Fimeinakas, kind of give you an idea of the views that you get from the top of them. So this is from the Bafuan. We're looking off the top corner, looking off to the east. They're Couple pedestrians walking. And then the causeway will come into view right about now. All right, now I'm going to show you the top of Fimianaka, starting with that shrine in the middle that we just mentioned right there. I found it very impressive that they granted us access right to the very top of these spaces. And as you can see, there's very limited handrails or any sort of safety. So I'm kind of glad I did this when I was 30 rather than if I was a little bit older than 30. I don't know if I could have kept up with that if I uh, was a little bit older. All right, so another large, impressive temple site in this complex is the Bayon. This one is also kind of famous for the many hundreds of stone carved faces you get here with a gaze that has been called the Khmer smile. You can sort of think about it like the Mona Lisa smile. It's sort of this sort of interesting grin. And people have debated, is the face depicted in this a ruler or is it a Buddha or what, who is it? And if it's a ruler, it's sort of interesting because the ruler's looking at you from every possible angle, sort of grinning at you. It's sort of like a big brother thing. Not entirely sure, but 
a very fascinating site to go and explore. And it was also unfinished. It was so ambitious and so large, they never actually got to complete it. The ruler died before they were able to finish the temple. And of course, the most famous temple in Cambodia is Angkor Wat. It's the largest and the most continuously used temple in that entire series of complexes that I mentioned. So when I say it's 900 years old, that's 900 years of continuous use as first as a Hindu temple dedicated to the god Vishnu, and later, and it's hard to say exactly when, gradually transitioned to being a Buddhist religious facility. And mostly the conversion just involved adding some devotional statues to Buddha inside it. They didn't actually remove or change a lot of the Hindu architecture. As the site has been continuously maintained and occupied, it's in one of the more complete states compared to those other temples that you got to see. Now I could talk a lot about the architecture in a technical sort of way, but I want to focus on two important features of those temples that I found most fascinating and revealing to me as someone who's interested in anthropology and human culture. And that's these reliefs, these carvings that were made along the walls of these temples. And they sort of range between two different things. You have a mythological sort of theme that you often see in these temples. And without getting too deep into the, uh, the Hindu mythology here, this is basically a symbolic tug of war going on between gods and demons with Vishnu sort of overseeing it in the middle. And as I mentioned in my online class, I sort of see it like a metaphor for the way Cambodia is now. It's getting tugged and pushed or pulled by different forces, development, pollution, corruption, things like that are sort of pulling at this country in all kinds of directions. It kind of reminded me of this mythology they had of this tug of war going on between angels and demons. The other kind of depictions that you see in the wonderfully detailed stone carvings here our daily life. A lot of the things that average people living in Cambodia 800 to 1,000 years ago were doing. And I do want you to pay attention to this scene because we're going to actually see a modern example of this exact thing. We have a wooden canopy right here. We have a healer putting a healing blessing on someone who is sick right now. And just outside that awning we have somebody who's actually making a meal. We have some fish getting barbecued and a, a meal getting cooked in a pot. Now we're not going to see the, the meals necessarily cooked, but we're, we're going to focus on the healer. If we move now from Siem Reap over to Cambodia's capital, Phnom Penh, which means Penn's Hill, at the top of that famous hill is actually a wooden pedestal shrine and a healer, in this case, giving a blessing to a Cambodian family who went to the top. So that practice is still going on even 800 years later of healers uh, giving blessings to local residents here. And so I found that very interesting. Now this picture also doesn't do it justice. If I had video of this, there's actually like these psychedelic lights going on behind this statue. And while you might at first glance assume that this might be a statue of Buddha, this is actually a statue dedicated to what you could say is the founding mother of Phnom Penh because Penh is a, a woman who, according to legend, discovered several statues to Buddha and then built a shrine close to her home and it helped attract visitors and found the city of Phnom Penh. And so in honor of her as the founding mother, they've built this shrine and she has the most prominent high spot on it and people come up here to visit her and ask for good luck. And further down on this uh, large hill that they have that's dedicated to their founding mother, is a Buddhist shrine that actually has some very interesting offerings here. Now these are stone lions and in their mouths they actually have pieces of raw meat. And that seems rather odd at first. Uh, according to the tradition, if you offer meals to these stone statues, they will devour the bad luck in case you, you know, help protect you from any sort of bad or unfortunate thing. So it's sort of like a good luck charm. So on your way up to the shrine, maybe to get a blessing, uh, pay your respects to the founding mother. You may also be trying to get a little good luck by offering some meat. A third thing which I don't have uh, a slide of here is we actually got to release sparrows is another way you can sort of offer prayers on top of this which my wife and I enjoy doing that. It was kind of a fun activity. Some other types of religious sites that you see around Phnom Penh. Uh, this is actually a very small shrine. It's only about two feet tall but it's pretty common. You see that outside of a lot of homes and businesses in Cambodia and it seems like it's open and available to anybody going down the street or maybe the residents of the house. And one thing that helps you know the scale, these are Christmas lights that are being strung along here to kind of give you a sense of that scale. 
other types of religious features that I saw. This is actually a poured concrete Buddha, but you can see that it is actually being cared for and venerated actively, even though it's a concrete replacement to an original stone one that's now in a museum. And what's interesting is that when you go inside a museum in, in Cambodia, those statues are also still being actively venerated, even though they're on pedestals and they have plaques like you'd see in a traditional Western museum. So just because it's in a museum, they don't stop uh, actively using and worshiping those statues. And lastly here, we have a mosque. There are some Muslims in there. Many of them are coming from Vietnam. They are the Cham people. And they have their own mosques. And uh, I'll talk a little bit more about their life ways in a little bit. I also found this particular moment endearing because as I was driving by, I got to see this father and son going into the mosque. And literally the son in red right here is skipping up the steps, ready to go into service. Now, I had my own church experiences growing up, but I can't remember any particular moment I was skipping up the steps going into church for services, but for whatever reason, I found this just completely charming. All right, and then uh, a Buddhist temple here. This is a very active one right now, and it's going uh, under a complete restoration. This is just outside of Phnom Penh. This is called Udong Temple. It is actually on top of a mountain where many of these religious shrines and facilities, you see the kind of vertical architectures trying to symbolize or represent mountains. This one actually is on top of a mountain. 500 steps climbing all the way up to the very top of that Udon Mountain. And I was very fortunate to see the restoration work, especially down here, I actually got to see plaster workers working on all the intricate designs down there. Very fascinating. They're inlaying gold in the doors right now. Very impressive place. Back in the center of Phnom Penh, I did also want to mention some of the royal architecture. Cambodia has royalty. It's mostly a, a democracy, but there is also sort of like in Great Britain, uh, a royal a family in succession. In fact, they just recently had a, a new king crowned a couple of years ago. This is the royal throne hall right here. And just adjacent to it is a shrine that actually is paved in solid silver tiles. Really remarkable kind of building, uh, very, meant to be very impressive. I also found this other pavilion building fascinating. You see this open balcony right over here on the side. Now, now that, in the 19th century, was for the king. If he wanted to go ride out on a royal elephant, they could bring the elephant up and he could board at the height of the elephant back there. Now another thing that kind of ties this a little bit to English royal traditions there's a flagpole right back there. You see the blue flag. When the flagpole is all the way at the top, very much like in England, it means that the royalty is in the country. So in this case, the king is in the country. If this was at half staff, that would mean the royalty is out of the country or as was the case a few years back, the king was deceased and there was no king active at that moment. I'm gonna transition a little bit now into how average people are living their daily lives, making a living. And I want to start with the textile industry really briefly. I got a wonderful opportunity to go explore a silk factory, a very traditional one in terms of how they hand make all of the silk cloth that they do. You see on the back of her shirt, it's Artisans of Angkor. I'm going to be talking about them a little bit later on. A very interesting group. So I got to see the whole production cycle of making silk garments. So starting out with silkworms here eating mulberry leaves that they grow right outside the silk factory. Once those silkworms have had several days of eating as many mulberry leaves as they can, they get ready to form cocoons. They lay them in the, these round baskets like this. Then after they form their cocoons, they're plucked out of the basket. The cocoons are then boiled. And yes, the, that does kill the silkworms, which are then turned into a local snack. So it's a bit of a delicacy. And no, I did not get a chance to eat them. They didn't offer any, unfortunately. Uh, would have tried if they did. Uh, and lastly, after these cocoons are boiled, the threads are drawn out and spun and then woven into cloth. I actually got a short video clip now of one of the women working those looms. And she was working really quickly, and, but I think she sort of set the rhythm for the rest of the place. I mean, really being surrounded by these looms, it felt like everything was sort of humming, almost like music. So this, this woman was sort of like the bass player or the drummer. She was sort of laying the beat down for everybody else. So listen to this. So that was sort of a very interesting experience. Noise, clatter, very chaotic, but had a certain rhythm to it. It was a very interesting space to explore. 
And then afterward, it also gave me a greater appreciation for all the handmade silk garments that they had. Some other kinds of production that I got to see in Cambodia and a little bit in Vietnam is here. We have some of that traditional carving. We got to see all of those great stone carvings I was mentioning before. This person is working in wood, but you see that, that traditional elongated earlobe right there? That's a very traditional Khmer or Cambodian style uh, form of carving and representing people. Here we actually have someone who's showing me how to make pottery on a potter's wheel. And I got a very good appreciation for how those foot powered potter wheels are Oh, but they, they really take some energy to keep up and keep that spinning there. Also, my big clumsy hands, uh, I was not as good at making these as he was. He's, his little hands, he could really make some amazing forms with that. But I tried to be a good student. Over here, we're actually looking at a brick kiln. Now, this is helping to supply the booming building market that they have here. There's lots of construction going on. And the way they're making these local bricks from the clay is by cutting down and burning the forest, cutting down a lot of the trees from the jungle. Could talk later on about how sustainable that particular idea is, but for right now, that's how they're supporting their booming construction market and making these bricks. Now lastly, this is actually from Vietnam, but I wanted to show it here because it's a very interesting kind of production. And this was more commonplace about 40 years ago during the Vietnam War. This is a gentleman who is making sandals out of old tires. And he was offering to make them custom to the size of your own foot for about a dollar and could probably do it in under a day. A uh, very fascinating process. This was actually at, an, at another interesting site I'm going to talk about in a little while, but I just wanted to feature his, his kind of production there. All right, so I've talked about how some people are making their daily living through making things. Others are growing and fishing as well. So I want to talk about their lives a little bit. So over here, we have some rice paddies and rice harvesting going on. This is a very small scale local family scale kind of production that's going on here in Cambodia. And I did see a little bit of mechanical assistance with tilling and plowing, but a lot of it's still getting done by water buffalo. Now this particular water buffalo is very curious in what we were doing in their rice paddy. So, uh, but in the background of that shot, you see something else going on. These are summer homes that are getting built into the former rice paddy field. So as places like Seam Reap and Phnom Penh are rapidly growing, developing, expanding, they're pushing these rural farmers further and further away from the markets that they rely on to sell their goods. And that was one thing that I kept seeing again and again, that certain types of uh, people that are trying to make their living are getting pushed further away from the places they need to be. And these rural farmers are one case of that. Now I'm going to give you a little view of what that rural border between the rice paddy fields and uh, the cities look like. I want you to pay attention to how the houses are set on stilts here. I'm here in January at the height of the dry season, so it almost looks very strange or alien that they, these houses would be up on high poles like they are. So then just think in six months time, seven months time, how much water must be flowing through this area for their houses to be set this high off the ground. So I want you to pay attention to that. Now, another important group making their living directly around Phnom Penh are the Cham people. I mentioned them briefly, they're practicing Muslims. Very peaceful people, they focus on fishing mostly. And they have a very transient lifestyle. They're very much like gypsies. Their homes are on these boats like this. So they uh, spend most of their lives on the water. This is on the Mekong River. They're actually right at uh, the end of a peninsula that joins the Tonle Sap and the Mekong rivers. A very strategic location allows them to fish a large area. And also, they are just outside of Phnom Penh, which is at the joining of those two rivers. So this gives them a great market to sell their fish. And you can see here their beautifully decorated blue boats. But this 
type of location, this kind of lifestyle is changing rapidly as well. In the background of this shot that I took here is a 750 room, soon to be five star luxury hotel. This is the booming tourism trade that's coming into the area. And I was told by my guide that this is going to be complete probably in about a month from now in April. All of these fishermen are going to be kicked off of the peninsula. It's going to be completely cleared off of the fishermen. They're gonna to have to move downriver to try to find another place to set up a settlement where they can service their boats and maintain them. It's gonna push them further away from the markets that they depend on to sell their fish and make their living. Now this has happened to them several times before. I mentioned they have a gypsy-like lifestyle. They have to move on when things get too difficult for them. But it's unfortunate that now they're getting pushed out by booming growth and development. So they're sort of missing out on this. I talked about those markets that all these different people benefit from. Here's a few shots of those markets. Up in the top here, this still picture doesn't do it enough justice. This is a lot of hardware for your own personal shrine or temples. This thing in the middle was actually spinning around like a disco ball, if you can imagine that. All these brilliant LED lights sparkling and twinkling. Various votive sort of things that are glowing and flashing at the same time, very dramatic. We also have something called God money here in the middle. It's considered okay in these shrines to offer money, but you can also burn or offer fake money, and that's considered to the gods equally good. So if you don't want to spend real money at the shrine, you can also spend less expensive god money. Here's some very fresh local foods. Being as part of that, that Mekong River system that I talked about, there's a lot of fresh produce uh, coming in, both fruit and vegetables, and also fresh meat. And what I could do, or even the locals do, you pick the types of fruit and vegetables that you want, the meat that you want, you then go probably just right off the edge of this picture to a place where someone will cook that fresh for you, if you like. So a lot of fresh local food. Uh, it almost has to be in this warm environment. It goes bad very quickly. I also want to say this dragon fruit that you see right here. In the United States, I checked a Cub Foods. That can cost $10 each if we wanted to buy some of that dragon fruit now. 40 cents, probably about 40 cents in United States dollars is all that would cost me to have some of that fresh fruit there. So really remarkable, amazing fresh food and that goes into how their delicious meals are and I'm gonna talk about that later. When I talk about Cambodia, especially people who've lived for at least 40 years or so know there's been a very tragic past tied to Cambodia and that's about the rule of a communist group called the Khmer Rouge. Uh, without going too far into the politics of it, they rose to power in the mid-1970s through the backing of China and Vietnam. As soon as they completed their rise to power, they almost as quickly killed off those Chinese and Vietnamese advisors and decided to run the country the way they wanted to, to very idealized, politically motivated leadership. And as you see in this very strict list of rules, I don't need you to read them all out in detail, but basically it's pretty much break the rules and you are harmed either through electrocution or beating. It was a very, very tragic time. A lot of people were sent to be detained or imprisoned and many people didn't come back from that experience. The loss of human life there was absolutely staggering in that short four year period where they were in charge of Cambodia. Some people estimate that to be as many as two million people died at that time through execution. So I gotta talk a little bit about that. There are some historic sites that commemorate what happened there to help people remember why this shouldn't ever happen again. One of those in the center of Phnom Penh is a place called Tool Slang. It's also known as S21. The reason it's known as S21 is because it used to be a public school. The Khmer Rouge, when they rose to power, closed almost every single school in the country and many of them were turned into detention centers, prisons. The one here in S21 was for intellectuals, so lawyers, doctors, any sort of political elite who didn't see their way of rule were thrown into this prison. Classrooms, think about this college right here. The classrooms turned into one, uh, maybe three foot by maybe six foot long cells. Really, really gruesome kind of existence there. And I have a guidebook later on if people are interested in looking at it, but it shows very graphically from one of the survivors who painted pictures of playground equipment being turned into implements of torture. Really awful, awful stuff. And 
This was the prison for interrogations. You could be thrown into this prison on trumped up charges. You could be thrown into this prison for very trivial things. And during that process of being in the prison, they wanted you to confess to those crimes under torture. And of course, if you did, then they would document your case. They'd take a photo of you, which you weren't allowed to smile. And in fact, I only saw one person out of the hundreds of photos of prisoners that they showed that smiled. And then you were the, sent out to the killing fields. And I didn't get a chance to go to the killing fields, and I'll talk a little bit about that later if people ask. But that's where literally millions of people were murdered. It's really tragic. This barbed wire fence is original to that structure from the mid-1970s. That was to keep people from escaping and jumping out. And not to jump out for freedom, to jump out and commit suicide, because there wasn't going to be any way to escape otherwise. So it's just reminding is how painful and tough it was. It was really hard for me to go through here and understand this, but I knew I had to go to understand what this country had gone through in the last 40 years and the amazing recovery that it's had since then. This last picture in the middle I want to show is actually a museum board that's supposed to be showing the pictures of the leaders of the Khmer Rouge with Pol Pot, the, the head of that group, at the top. Now, of course, you notice all the faces are scratched out. Now, much of this museum is very well maintained, and so I find it very interesting that the people maintaining this museum have either given up or just allowed the peoples who are frustrated, who've come through here, who have this lasting legacy of tragedy, have scratched out all the likenesses and faces of the Khmer Rouge. So it shows that there's still this lingering pain associated with this time and anger at the leaders who put their country through this. Now, another unique and interesting experience, the, an opportunity that I really had in Phnom Penh that I don't know how else I could have gotten otherwise, was to actually meet some people from North Korea. And you might ask, how, how would that be possible? It was at a restaurant, a restaurant owned and operated by the state of North Korea. Now, normally I'd say I would never be interested in doing anything that might support the state of North Korea, but it was really my only way I could pot potentially meet this group of people, which I, I find the political and social situation there very fascinating, even if I don't agree with very much of it. Uh, and so I wanted to get an opportunity to actually meet actual North Koreans uh, living and working in Phnom Penh. Now, what you see over here is the meal that I enjoyed at the restaurant. And uh, there's a lovely beef soup, one of the best beef soups I've ever eaten. Uh, some fermented cabbage called kimchi, very traditional meal. And then my wife had this chicken dish, which we both agree was completely inedible. I don't know what exactly it was, but it was literally like grizzle and bones. You, you just tried to chew it and it was just slimy and painful. We, uh, <laughs> I don't know how else to describe it. And I asked some other people who've been to Korea if any of these meals are really traditional to the north, and they said no. So I found that also interesting that the things that were provided here, it's very structured. It's meant to project a particular image of how uh, North Korean culture is and, and what they want to project. And, and I learned that very quickly, very structured, organized sort of activity. And one other thing I need to talk to you about, these uh, waitresses that we had who are dressed in these traditional garb here, they are also the performers. Actually, can I get a quick show of hands? Has anybody ever worked in the food service industry here? Anybody here? Okay, good, good number of hands. Now, imagine if you were a waiter or waitress in, 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 the, in the restaurant or place that you are, and then you're expected to do a very active 45 minute music and dance show. After you've seated your guests, you've taken their order, you've delivered their order, you do this performance for 45 minutes, and then you have to go back, make sure they don't want a last round of drinks, and then you have to clean and bust all the tables by the end of the night. And we're talking a packed house, 80 people, and there's maybe 10 of you as servers. How long do you think any of you could have keep that up? One day, two days maybe? It's incredible. That's what these waitresses, these North Korean waitresses were doing at this particular restaurant. It's amazing, I couldn't believe it. So now I want to do a little video segment. All right, I'm gonna do that briefly. And now uh, I learned after the fact that we weren't supposed to be showing <laughs> video of this place. There was actually a sign that said no recording. So by the way, I am not Ultrasoundo or whoever this is. So if North Korea gets upset with me for this, uh, go after him. All right. Yeah. 
I'm going to transition over to Saigon. A uh, very interesting area. Used to be the capital of South Vietnam 40 years ago, but now has become a very major cosmopolitan city now that the North has taken over the country. Uh, and politically, they changed the name to Ho Chi Minh City, but still many of the locals that I interacted with still call it Saigon. I wanted to show quickly some of the religious structures there. We have Notre Dame Cathedral, Catholic Cathedral, and one of the major ethnic Chinese shrines that I got to see. In the background here, it's a little hard to tell, but there are actually a lot of kind of good wish, uh, good luck wishes sort of put inside Notre Dame Cathedral. And in the background, sort of not unlike those LED backlit Buddhas that I was talking about, we have a neon blue Virgin Mary, a neon Madonna. So it's this interesting sort of modern and traditional sort of worship space there. I found that very fascinating. You know, also the good luck wish is very similar to sort of the Buddhist devotional things that I saw. So it's an interesting spin on this. And while most people in Vietnam don't have a professed faith, Catholicism is growing there very rapidly right now. Uh, probably one of the largest growing demographics. Uh, along with traditional Buddhist practice is also growing there quite rapidly now. The government's become a lot more tolerant of religion there. Here I am at that uh, ethnic Chinese Buddhist shrine. I'm lighting a coil of incense with a wish on it. And then after I finished lighting it, it was raised up there and that incense is meant to burn and send my wishes off to the spirits above, kind of doing it that way, rising smoke with the rising wishes to go with it. And then I was photobombed by the most adorable child, so I had to put this picture in. Now, of course, as I talked about some of the tragic things that have happened in Cambodia, there's been very lengthy, protracted conflict in Vietnam as well. And if those of you are comfortable, have any of you served in Vietnam in the past? Anyone in the audience? Yes, well, thank you, I appreciate it. I'm also very interested in your insights about your time, if you're willing to share that with me. One of the places I went that talked about the war, and I know it's highly politicized, the viewpoints that were shared here, is the War Remnants Museum. I'm gonna talk about that in a little bit. One thing I also got to explore in Vietnam was the tunnel system. Just outside of Saigon, there are a preserved series of tunnels that help protect the Viet Minh, the Viet Cong, the no also known as the North Vietnamese, who are fighting the South Vietnamese and the Americans during the Vietnam War. It's been developed into a tourist area now. My guide said that the first hole that you see in the jungle floor here is actually meant to be a, a booby trap hole, one that's this, this large and this wide was not actually meant to be used by the enemy soldiers that were hiding. That was meant to sort of lure people in as a trap. The actual entrances were probably not much wider than your shoulders, incredibly narrow openings. And then those would lead to series of tunnels multiple levels down to get out of the way of aerial bombings that were going on at the time. I was also told that the width of this tunnel that I'm sitting in with my wife here was actually widened for tourists as well. Again, incredibly narrow, dark, sort of tunnels and places, and that's where whole communities would hide during bombing raids for up to a week at a time. The last thing I have here is what was, uh, I was told was a common meal that would be had by people living under those tunnels during the war. And that is a boiled tapioca root, a little bit of sugar, and some peanuts. And then you dip the boiled tapioca into that and have a sip of green tea as your meal. Now my guide said even in the 1990s, just before the embargo ended with, between the United States and Vietnam, he sometimes had to subsist on these meals because their economy was just doing so poorly and very few people could make a substantial living to buy anything more significant than tapioca root to eat. So that's even still within the living memory of many of the people my age is eating this boiled tapioca root. Now I mentioned that War Remnants Museum, highly political museum, it's definitely driving its own viewpoint about the war very much by the government of Vietnam. It's mostly talking about how the colonial powers and later the Americans were doing atrocities here. It doesn't talk about the side of what caused soldiers and their commanders to make those choices, which as an American, I always felt a certain amount of pushback on all the sorts of displays I saw. I also got to say it was a particularly jarring and uncomfortable experience at moments where, say, I was walking by this tank and I'd be mobbed by uh, school children, some of them wanting to take photos with the American by the tank. It's sort of an unsettling experience, maybe, becoming the subject 
of these sort of displays like this, not just uh, a visitor, so to speak. Another case was a, a big plexiglass display of an American soldier with an M16, and me realizing as the children are mobbing and walking around it, I'm more similar to what's inside the display case than the visitors that I'm surrounded by in the museum. It's, it's very unsettling. And it's meant to, I think, be unsettling to foreigners that are coming to visit this museum. The rooms are organized by theme, not by time necessarily. So like this room is painted orange for Agent Orange. And other ones are organized by the types of military hardware. And I was told that some of these, they pulled the fuses out, but they didn't actually remove the explosives. So if any of you do visit that part of Vietnam, I wouldn't go bumping the display cases too hard. So this was a very interesting space. It gave me a different view of how the Vietnam War was perceived from certain people there. Of course, it didn't change all my opinions. In fact, it made me want to push back against some of the things I saw. Now moving on, of course, the one last major theme I wanted to talk about was all the amazing food that I got to see in this Mekong River Delta. So here we're looking at a savory sort of crepe, uh, a meal like that. I'm gonna get into, of course, if you wanted to have something to drink to refresh yourself, they could just carve you a coconut and stick a straw in and just drink the coconut water right out of that. Other sort of meals with fresh bitter greens, ginger, and it's hard to see these little orange spots, those are tree ants. They actually gave a nice bitter and crunchy sort of texture to the meal. Actually quite lovely if you get the chance to eat at places like this. Lots of fresh food, like I was saying, fresh seafood, fresh things from the river. Again, those savory crepes that I was talking about called Ban Zio were being formed here. This was called Jumping Chicken by my guide. You can imagine what that probably is. It's frog legs. Now, I talked to some other people here really briefly about the coming of the food chains, McDonald's. Now, if you see right in this corner, you have the communist hammer and sickle next to the golden arches. And the question I'd love to pose to some of you who've uh, lived long enough, 40 years ago, which yellow symbol of global domination would you have been more afraid of? And in that 40 years, has your opinion about that changed any? Just food for thought. Other types of food, and I, and I can report on the food scene there, I think is pretty safe in terms of I don't think McDonald's is going to take over all the lovely food that I got to see. When a delicious banh mi sandwich, sort of another colonial legacy of the French, that baguette, filled with all kinds of delicious fresh food for one dollar. Very satisfying, delicious meal. If that can only cost a dollar, I think it's going to compete very well with the Big Macs and Chicken McNuggets. Another place, Pho 2000 delicious pho. It rose to fame because President Bill Clinton visited there. Actually got to sit next to the table that he had at the restaurant. One of the best bowls of pho I've had. Lovely iced coffee, some basil and bitter greens in there, some spicy peppers. It's a beef noodle soup. If you ever get down into the cities and try some pho, it's delicious. I highly recommend it. Getting it here hot and fresh of uh, fresh vegetables, it's amazing. Now, concluding. So what? So I did all these great things and interesting things. I learned a lot of things. How does that matter? What should you take away from this experience? How you travel to these places does matter. What you patronize, what you decide to support does matter. And that's what I would recommend as a take home thing for you. Teaching restaurants were a very important thing that my wife and I tried to find. Teaching restaurants are ones that employ local youth ones that didn't get a chance to get an education or just underemployed or unemployed, uh, who normally would have been just living out on the street. Giving them a skill, teaching them how to be servers, restaurant managers, cooks, in particular the ones that were run by this Friends Business Network. Really great group. Trying to find locally made crafts. Now I'm not just talking about going into the local marketplaces there. Many of those are chock full of inexpensive goods that were made probably over in China or somewhere and shipped in, trying to exploit the, the kind of tourism niche of that area. Going to places like I mentioned, Artisans of Encore, seeing how those products are made, it helps support local skills, local crafts, local culture. It gives these people meaningful employment. So more than just supporting the merchant in the market, by purchasing something. If you go a little bit further and trying to find those places where those crafts are being practiced, that can be a really great support to local people. 
Another thing is attending performances by locals. I didn't get a chance to show some slides of this, but preserving the Khmer traditional music and arts is also another thing that's going on right now. And they employ local youth again, empowering them, giving them a sense of pride in their culture and meaningful employment at the same time. And all of that was possible for my wife and I because, and this is unlike my honeymoon, honestly, I should have, I overplanned that. Time for unplanned interaction, discovering interesting things, having time to interact with locals in meaningful ways that you couldn't have anticipated. That gave me the chance to find and help all these different groups out through my experience as a tourist. And I highly recommend that for wherever you travel. Now lastly, I wanna have my wife wave farewell to us. We're going through downtown Saigon at night on a scooter. And overhead you will see the North Vietnamese and South Vietnamese flags shown overhead in bright lights. Now the reason they did that is because this is the 40 year anniversary of the reunification of Vietnam. At the end of the North and South now becoming one country. So they're sort of commemorating that during this festival. It's Tet Festival, so it's the Lunar New Year, big holiday, sort of like Christmas and Thanksgiving and maybe Hanukkah all wrapped up into one week-long festival. Bright, awesome lights. And now with the 40-year anniversary of the country being unified, they're really kind of pulling out the stops. So here we are. My wife will say farewell to us, and I'll take any questions you have right at the end of this.